you very much for that introduction. Um, as she said, my name is Dr. Grimes, and I've been in practice now for, I mean, if you count the first time I saw a client, that was back in 1996. Um, so I've been working and sitting with people now for almost 23 years. Um, my specialty really is in treating trauma, um, so, and that's particularly complex trauma. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is one thing I use with those clients, with their spouses, to kind of just help them understand a little bit of what they are going through um, and to use it as a tool to help them process often what they think and what they feel as a way that can actually help them better communicate with those that they truly and dearly love. Um, one thing you may not know about me is I've actually shot hippos for a living. Uh, I've also dealt with mining cars and sent people on perilous journeys. Um, what that means is I've worked at Disneyland. I was an attraction host. <laughs> I told all those dumb jokes on the Jungle Cruise, uh, where you'd go around it about 24 times a day and say those jokes over and over and over again. So if some silly, uh, nonsensical humor slips in, please understand it's that Disney influence that's uh, affecting what I'm doing here today. Um, <laughs> As part of the reason, I'll likely start off here with um, just a couple quick little comic strips about thinking. This is Garfield and Odie. Many of you may recognize it. He says, sometimes I wonder what you're thinking, Odie. Odie stands there, scratches his head, and Garfield responds, obviously that makes two of us. So sometimes Odie just doesn't know what's going through his own mind. And then secondly, Mother Goose and Grimm. Do you carry a book called The Power of Positive Thinking? No. Why not? I didn't think anybody would buy it. <laughs> These can be a couple little snippets often into how our own thoughts often affect us. Um, what I want to do today is um, kind of give you some insight into that. And these are just some simple quotes um, about thinking there's obvious the one everybody knows by Descartes, um, cognito ergo sum, which literally means I think, therefore I am. I like what Henry Ford had to say. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And then I like John Locke here, the philosopher. Reading furnishes the mind only with materials of knowledge. It is the thinking that makes what we read ours. Um, and my hope is through this process that some of this skill will actually uh, be passed on and that you'll have a better understanding of how to use your own thought process to grow your mind. Um, for me, this is really what I hope we're going to rest in for the hour we have here today is Romans 12, 1 and 2, um, where we can you know, be encouraged, as it says here. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to, to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Um, my hope is that this will be a skill that you'll be able to walk away with, something that you'll be able to kind of monitor your own thoughts with and even be able to help enter into others and what they think with um, so that we can do this, so that we can be that embodied body of Christ as we support and encourage one another. Um, so for me, I think of this as mental formation, what I'm going to talk about today. And the way I view it is it's the consistent renewing of our minds and thinking so that we are centered on God and his wisdom for our lives. In other words, it's that place of God in our minds where we can kind of keep him there, where he can rest there and we can rest there in his presence. Um, I think this is important. I think there's a huge need for it constantly and consistently. Um, the mind has a huge place in affecting other parts of our being. As we heard today, the mind is intimately connected with our body. We can't separate one from the other. Um, too often what we think and feel move together. Um, what we are like is what is on our minds. So 
Um, you want to learn to live in such a way that God, if possible, is always on your mind. Um, that's one of the things I love about Dallas Willard um, that he constantly talked about was this ability to rest in this place where God was constantly in his thoughts. Um, what, what blew me away when he said this, because I considered him to be a very spiritual, almost monk-like individual, he said, the more I found I did it, the, rest, the, the less I realized I actually kept my thoughts on God. So the more he learned to do, do it, the, the more he realized how far away he was from actually keeping God constantly on his mind. Um, and if he was in that place, that made me feel like I had a long way to go. Um, and our minds have ideas, images, beliefs, patterns of inferences. These are feelings in response to those ideas. What you think about, what occupies your mind, um, often governs your feelings. And they can be intimately connected together. All right. So before I go in to actually how we think and the, the way that works, there's two things I want to talk about. One is this window of tolerance that was developed by Daniel Siegel. Okay? And then the second thing I'll talk about a little later after this is actually how quickly our brains will work. Um, because it's important to understand that in order to grasp how quickly our thoughts can get away from us and cause us a lot of problems. And as I'm doing this here today, if you guys do have questions, please don't hesitate to slow me down, raise your hand, or ask your questions. Uh, I want to do the best I can to ensure that we're working together as we go through this process. Um, this isn't about me just standing here and go, here, have this information. Um, I want this to be something that you feel like is very effective for you. I call the window of tolerance the Goldilocks zone. Uh, it's easier to remember for a lot of people. Um, it's the basically the place where we're able to be our best self, where we can think and feel and respond to what's happening in front of us rather than react. Okay? And the reason I call it the Goldilocks zone is because when things get too hot or too cold, we stop thinking clearly. And I'm going to describe this by using a classic graph of the way our endocrine system works inside our body when we get emotionally activated and we get aroused. Um, they use this all the time when teaching anger management skills um, to people. So this is just a classic graph here in the middle of what goes on in the endocrine system when we get triggered. When we're calm and relaxed, we sit right here. But then as things go on, triggers will take place. Okay, And these triggers can be anything. They can be traffic that we have to deal with. It can be accidentally hitting snooze on our phone and actually turning the alarm off so we don't wake up on time when we need to. It could be because we're having a headache or even feeling a little under the weather. And then what happens is, is slowly, step by step, our internal level of frustration goes up and up and up. Do you guys ever experience this during your day? You know, you wake up, you're feeling pretty good, you're feeling pretty relaxed and calm, and then as you go through your day, you find yourself with less and less tolerance you're more easily frustrated, you get bothered by things people say or things people do, or you may even just be more frustrated with yourself. Why am I not getting this done? Why do I keep forgetting things? That means your arousal level is going up and your ability to tolerate things is going down. In other words, your window is shrinking on you. Um, as this progresses, an interesting thing happens. I'm going to borrow from... Um, a very well-known play, some of you may have seen it, called Phantom of the Opera. Anybody been to that? There's a song in it. The song is actually called Point of No Return. The point of no return is when you start to heat up so much from your triggers that you reach a point that you can't contain yourself anymore. What's going to happen is you're either going to get really angry and you're going to start to push back. You're going to start to say things. You're going to start to do things to try and get yourself to come back down into your window of tolerance, to stop those things that are frustrating you. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Now, if you can't get people to stop because you're angry or you're frustrated, people will do this. They'll drop down here to the point where they go cold. Um, most men, when you're 
engaging them. Wives will understand this. Do you, some of your husbands just kind of go cold and distant? Do they just kind of shut down when you're trying to talk to them? If that's happening, that means they've dropped down here. They've gone into this place where they don't want to get angry. They don't want to scream. They don't want to yell because that's not going to be productive. So they go cold. And when we go cold, they're, they're, trying, to, they're trying to be nice. Um, but we are unable to interact with people when we go to either place, when we're too hot or we're too cold. Okay, so our judgment in this is affected. Yes? Yes. Yeah. What will happen is people get angry and they get frustrated. And then if for some reason that doesn't change the interaction that's going on, uh, that they're engaged with, um, they will go cold and they'll go quiet, which again is a way. All this movement is for one thing, to try and get back here into the middle of the window of tolerance where I feel like I'm okay. It's really trying to decrease this spike that goes on. When we get hit with adrenaline, we get hit with cortisol, all those stress hormones go off. Does that kind of make the sense? Yeah. And so everything is to try to get back to this place where we have good judgment. What happens as we heat up is our judgment goes from good to poor when we go either too hot or we go too cold. And then from poor, it actually goes to bad. So there's the adage, never make major life decisions when you're too angry, right? I tell clients when they come in, it's not just when you're angry. It can be when you're too happy. It can also be when you're too sad or you're too down. Um, if you're ever feeling strong emotions, you're not thinking clearly. Does that make sense? Um, any other questions so far on this and the window of tolerance and kind of what it means and what it looks like? Oh, we're going we're gonna to talk about that um, in this process and, and kind of what to do with that. Um, one of the simplest things is to call a timeout. I tell clients when they get frustrated, they get angry, they get upset like this, uh, the best thing they can do is take a break. Um, because what people end up doing when they get angry, or they end up going cold, um, is they're effectively calling a timeout. They're just doing it behaviorally. If you catch it early enough, you can. Okay? If you wait till you get to the point of no return, it's really hard to do that. There's so much adrenaline in our system that we're really ready to fight we're re or we're ready to run. And if we can't do either of those or those don't feel like they're working, that's when we go cold. Okay? Um, so taking a break works. And I tell people, set the... Set the time out anywhere from five minutes to 24 hours. Um, and I tell them that because depending on the time, you may actually need to go to bed and get some good sleep and then wake up in the morning, go back to work if you got to go to work and you're not able to get back to it till the next night. I said, but you have to give a time limit when you call the time out. Uh, too often, behaviorally, when the time out happens, um, there's no set time frame and when we're going to come back and revisit whatever it is that's made us too upset. So you got to give a time frame, five minutes to 24 hours. Whoever calls the timeout, it's their responsibility to come back to the other person and say, I'm ready to talk. Okay. If they're not ready to talk, they still need to go back to the person at the end of that timeout. If they ask for 10 minutes and ask for additional time again, still within that five minutes to 24 hour period. That's something that helps. Uh, another thing that helps get people back into the Goldilocks zone, it's just simple deep breathing. Take a deep breath. The way our bodies are responding, the quickest and fastest place to get us back in this Goldilocks zone is to slow down our respiration. When we get heated up, our heart rate goes up when we get here. So our heart's going to be beating really rapid and really fast. Our breathing's going to go shallow. We're going to breathe from the top of our chest here, uh, almost like we're hyperventilating. <laughs> the other thing people will do when this is going on, if they're not hyperventilating, is they'll do this. 
they'll hold their breath. Any of those actions are going to push us higher up this way because they're pushing the body into a response where they're better ready to fight or they're better, better ready to run. So just taking a simple deep breath is one way to make that happen. I tell people if they can do it, great way to make both of these happen, pray. Simply stop and pray. I don't know if you've ever stopped and watched when anybody prays. What's the first thing someone does when they stop to pray? Well, they close their eyes. The second thing they do is take a deep breath and they pause before they start to pray. It's always, Lord, and then they start to pray. It's just what everybody does. So prayer can be huge in helping to stop a lot of this from going on. So judgment gets vastly affected just by our physiology. So this complicates our ability to think if we're not aware of it. So being able to know physically what's going on can be a huge issue. How do you know your heart rate's going up? How do you know you're tense? Do you hold it in your hands? Do you hold it in your shoulders? Do you hold it in your chest? Does your voice get louder? Does your voice get quieter? Do you pull in? How do you hold your stress? And when you notice yourself starting to do those things, those are clear signs you need to do something to help yourself start relaxing. Okay? Any other questions? No? Okay. So now I want to get into um, the actual process of our speed of thinking. And I'm a bit frustrated, I must confess, because I couldn't get this after image to disappear. <laughs> So it's revealing everything that I'm going to want to present to you before I wanted to present it to you. So we're just going to go with it. Um, I eventually gave up because I was getting too frustrated and wanted to throw my iPad. My arousal mountain was going through the roof. Um, so uh, on average, since you can see my answers already, um, if you could take a guess, how fast do you think someone can speak? Quick, don't cheat. <laughs> Can speak. Yeah, that's what I should say. Miles per hour is basically what we're thinking. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of blown because you guys know what it is. Um, the average professional auctioneer can do about 200 to 225, 250 words a minute. They're really quick. You can think like legalese in the commercials and everything. This is it. Okay. The average person speaks approximately 125 to 150 words per minute. Okay, and that's just casual conversation. Okay? Now, the question is, how fast do we think? Okay? Much faster is actually the truth in all of this. Um, the question is, though, well, obviously we think faster, but the big question is, uh, well, I'd like you guys to guess. Well, you guys... Don't cheat. <laughs> Words per minute, what do you think we can kind of speak? Or think, I should say. No, it's not. We're going to get to that. Did you see my next slide already? <laughs> um, you're right. But the, the average is in research, it's about 1,200. Okay? 1,200. It's screaming in that respect. But the truth is, it's faster than what you're thinking already. Okay? Because the big question is, how do we think? Okay? And I want to do a thinking exercise. All, you, all, all I want you to do is think about the very first thing that comes to your mind. And what I want you to think about is a banana. Okay? What are what's some of the first things that came to your mind? Sure. Uh, peeling, back the peeling back the banana. Okay? Color. Color. Eating a banana? Okay. Great. That's, that, you guys are doing exactly what I wanted you to do, and I held the slide because I didn't want to give away everything. Um, you didn't have Webster's Dictionary pop up in your head? The words, a yellow uh, tropical fruit that when ripe turns yellow and is sweet to the taste. That didn't come up? Okay. That's good. We do. You, we visualize it. You saw the color yellow. You saw a picture of a banana. Maybe even saw a, banana, a monkey eating a banana. Okay, We think in images. 
Okay? But here's the hard part. How do we tra translate images to words per minute? Okay? So effectively, we're going to do this by using the adage, a picture is worth a thousand words. Okay? So if we take that as a rough estimate, the answer to how fast we think words per minute, we take 1,200 words, say that's images, and we multiply that by a picture's worth, a thousand words, we think at 1.2 million words per minute. Do you guys get how fast that is? It's screaming fast. You guys, uh, you guys have seen propellers on planes, right? Roughly, the average person will think at this speed. If we start to talk some developmental disabilities, this, this will slow down. But the average IQ of 100, which is what they say is average, thinks at this speed. Okay? Uh, the intelligence goes up. Um, it may speed up a little bit, but roughly this is what we clock at, which is really fast. Um, you guys know a propeller on a plane, right? When it stops, you can see it. What happens when it, that engine cranks up and it starts to spin? It, 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 it's, it appears to spin backwards, and if it's spinning fast enough, we actually can't see it. It's moving too fast for our eyes to comprehend. We can see the blurred edge where that propeller is spinning, and that's it. That's our thought process. That's how quick our brain works, okay? that make sense? Do you guys get how fast it is? Now I want to get into the meat and bones of what I'm talking about here today. Um, I do have some sheets here. Um, you're welcome to pass them out if you would like. Um, I encourage you, if there's enough, try to take two. Um, you can take notes on one and then the other one. Um, I'll explain how you can use it for an exercise um, to help yourself better understand your own thought process as well as to use even in communicating with others, okay? When I teach this to clients in my office, most of them are blown away by this. Uh, when they begin to think about it and begin to realize um, Many of them feel like it gives them the ability to actually understand their own thoughts for the first time. All right. Looks like we're almost there. Okay. Does everybody have one so far? Okay. Everybody got one? Good. All right. So where we're going to start is the first step, which is a nice little small box here. I call this box reality. Okay. Reality is based on just the facts. Those of us who are old enough can go back to a TV show called Dragnet. Anybody remember the show Dragnet? Okay, yes. <laughs> Detective Friday, played by Jack Webb. Classic line was, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Or you can think Dan Aykroyd in the movie if you remember it. The facts of reality, when we're interacting with people, it's body language. It's what they do with their body. It's what they do with their hands. It's what they do with their facial expressions, okay? Uh-oh, there it goes. It's their hand gestures, and it's eye contact, okay? It's just the facts. It's the raw data would be another way of saying this, okay? Tone of voice, Tone of voice would be another one. Um, the inflection they use, the pace they use, the volume they use in their voice, all of that is going to be just the facts. 
All right? After reality, it's something that just happens. And it's where our five senses take in all that data. Does that make sense? It's what we see. It's what we hear. It's what we taste. It's what we touch. We have no control over this. Okay? It just happens. We don't sit here and largely think, I'm going to see this. Now, we can pay attention. We can direct our focus onto different things. But that's about it. We don't tell our eyes what to see. We don't tell our ears what to hear. We don't tell our nose what to smell. Nor do we tell our tongue what to taste. It just happens. The data comes in. Now, once we've gone through this process, now we get to the part where we get into trouble. Lots of trouble. Um, From the music man, uh, you know, right there in River City. (laughs) Um, And interpretation is what it's called, is always based upon our perception of reality. Okay? Now, the one thing I didn't say about perception here is it's different for each and every one of us. What I see, what I hear, is very different from anyone else. That's why when police officers interview people who have seen the same accident, standing in literally almost the same spot can give four different reports of what occurred and what happened. Because everybody's unique in an individual. Now, interpretation, this is the beast of our engine when it comes to thinking. This is where we get ourselves into a ton of trouble because this is where we place meaning on everything. This is where we place meaning upon our perception of what reality is. Does that make sense so far? This is where we begin to ascribe value to it all. This can be affected by how we're doing physically When you wake up and you're feeling good and you've got a lot of energy, you feel like you can handle things better. If you wake up and you realize you've got a cold, you're feeling under the weather, now you get frustrated really easy. Everything not only frustrates you, but you can get down. You can get discouraged. You can get disappointed a lot quicker than if you feel good. Does this make sense so far? So it's not only affected by what we feel physically it can be affected by how we're doing emotionally if we have any sense of loss grief we have stress i don't know do you guys experience stress anybody anybody no never right stress that doesn't happen um it'll affect the way we begin to think all right it can be affected by how we're doing relationally you ever been frustrated at home and go to work and still find yourself even frustrated with your coworkers, or just frustrated with the way people are driving on the road um, or just frustrated that the copier is not working when it needs to be working? It can be affected by how you're doing mentally. We can have bad days mentally. We can wake up and we forget where our car keys are. We can't remember it until your spouse looks at you and goes, they're in your hand. And you go, oh, (laughs) you can't find what you're looking for when you're at work. So it's affected. We're affected mentally. Um, One of the biggest influencers in the way we interpret things is our family of origin. This is huge. Um, Do you guys understand what I mean when I say family of origin? This is how you were raised. These are some of the deepest rules that we function by. When we think how our family handled emotions. Was it okay to be sad? Was it okay to be angry? Was it okay to be disappointed? Could you express disagreement with mom or dad while you were growing up? Or 
when they told you to go do something, if you didn't go do it, did they get pissed at you? Did they get angry and treat you as though you were disrespectful? Um, how our families growing up handled emotions can hugely affect the way we think. The way we think about our spouses, the way we think about our children, the way we still think about our parents. Um, <laughs> one of the easiest ways to know what your family rules are, pay attention to how your behavior changes when you go home for the holidays. <laughs> one of the things my wife told me that she was surprised by when we went home to visit my family for Thanksgiving, she's like, your language changes. She's like, your voice takes on a childlike tendency. And I went, what? I went, you're kidding. She's like, no, you get, your mom has a baby talk. And when my mom relates to my brother, our I, she changes her very timbre in her voice. And it goes very sing-songy. And my brother and I can go very childlike in our responses to her. I was kind of like, wow. Never really noticed it because I'm so close to it. I'm used to it. I don't see it. Um, so you gotta, you gotta pay attention to how your family treated emotions, how your family treated even the way you thought. And that can be affected by birth order. If you're the youngest in your family, you might have been told what you were thinking was constantly stupid. And they would talk down to you like you don't know what you're talking about. Okay? So all of these things factor in, and most of us don't think about that. Most of us don't realize how our history affects our family of origin or a family of origin affects the way we think. Um, this can be affected by our values. What we hold dear will influence what we're thinking. It can be affected by our morals. And beliefs. All of these are running together at once. Constantly as we put meaning upon our perception of what reality is. It's a constant process. We're really lucky our brain works at 1.2 million words per minute. Because it is processing, processing an unbelievable amount of information. It's affected by our culture. Any questions so far about this? Yeah. Do I believe in body languages communicates what people are feeling? Yeah. Um, yeah, body language in general communicates an enormous amount of information, um, especially when we know what to look for and observe. Um, do I think every crossed leg and every cross arm means someone's not caring to hear what I'm talking about? No. There's so much more information I want to look at. I want to pay attention to um, the eye contact that they're still going to make. I want to pay attention to other behaviors they're going to do, like nodding of head and ahs and ohs. Are they tracking with whatever I'm doing? There's so much more information that will tell me, no, they're still present and they're still working with me and tracking with me in what I'm doing. If I get someone who crosses their arms and crosses their legs and starts to turn their body away from me and they start to look at me over their shoulder, I'm getting a clear message they're not paying attention to me. And they don't care what I'm talking about. Uh, one of the biggest indicators, if people are really tuning into you or not, pay attention to their feet. When you stand in a circle and you watch people interact, the people they most want to connect with, their feet will be pointing at them. An intriguing little piece of information. Yes. Well, it can be related to a person. This can be just anything that's happening in a, the environment. It can be a bird flying by. It can be um, 
It can be a car crash. It can be sounds happening in the distance. It can be the sound of a fire engine, a jet engine overhead. Um, it's just when we are in relationship and we are interacting with people, what we usually most pay attention to is the other individual. Okay. Now, after we've gone through all of this, we get to the next stage. Okay. And this is the biggest box. And this box is always based upon our interpretation of our perception of reality. Do you guys have any idea what this last box is? Kind of, nope, nope. We're going to go back to the 1970s. And I'm inaccurate. I was always inaccurate as to who I thought sang this song. Um, I always thought it was Barry Manilow, but it's not Barry Manilow. Um, it's feelings. You know, feelings... Nothing more than feelings. It's our emotions. <laughs> they always form after our interpretation of our perception of reality. This is why what we do here is so massively important. Because it really shapes what we feel. Now I have a question for you guys. What do you notice about the boxes? Yeah, they get bigger. What do you make of that? Compounded. What else? More important. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. It's all connected. It is absolutely all connected. It gets magnified. Each step, we add more and more. And more to what reality is. So reality becomes more and more distorted. Is what ends up happening. Yeah, it can. And that's where we get a feedback between our interpretation and our feelings. Where the way we think about something can feed the feeling. And the feeling comes back and reinforces the thinking. Little kid, yeah. How are feelings related to thought? Let me get to that. Um, think of a little kid, a little kid that comes up to mom and dad and goes up, up. Simple request. They're having a need to be held, okay? But mom or dad looks at this child and they go, no, I'm not picking you up. And what do you think the child feels? They feel rejected. They feel sad. They feel disappointed. Each time the child keeps coming back, up, up. And the parent keeps saying no over and over again. So the child begins to think, my need doesn't matter. And the child gets sad. The child's sad because the child feels like he'll never or she'll never be held. So my needs aren't going to be met. So they get sadder. And then they think, oh, I should go ask mom or dad to pick me up. Oh, but they're not going to pick me up. And then they come back, and they just keep going around and around and around in this process. Um, the reason our thoughts influence our feelings is because we've got, to, we've got to have some kind of meaning that we place on this. Does that make sense so far? And it all starts... In our early childhood, our parents teach us how to interact with herself. Um, a good mom who's holding her infant, usually 12 inches away as they're feeding them, can mirror back really well what the child's feeling. If the child's face goes sad, the mom's face goes sad. If the child's face is happy, the mom's face goes happy. These are the first stages where the child begins to put meaning on what's going on in their body. They're being actually taught that's what they're feeling. They're being taught that's what they're experiencing. So all this information comes in and we begin to ascribe what it means. We don't know what a feeling of happiness is until someone describes it's a warm, comfortable feeling inside. Okay? And it's only after we get that meaning applied to it that we go, oh, that's what it is. Is that... Kind of answer your question? Sort of? Okay. 
Okay. So we add so much more to it. It does become more personal as we do this. Now, do you remember how quickly we think? How quick? 1.2 million. Okay. So when you think of this process, where do most people expect reality to exist? Which box? Perception? Interpretation? Feelings. This is where most people think this exists. Too often in couples relationships when arguments arise. Now, this is just one person's page right here. This is just one person. You can have the same situation occur between a husband and wife. This is the wife's. The husband's going to have his perception, his interpretation, and his feeling. I used to draw this out on a pad of paper, and I would say it's amazing that people ever get on the same page. So often people get caught up in their own head. They get stuck in their own world that exists here. Um, in trauma work, they have what's called the back of the head scale. It's nothing really technical. It just represent, represents the difference between the end of my hand here being present in the moment, fully present, fully aware, engaged with what's happening right here and now. The more I move it back here, the more I'm caught up and stuck inside my own thoughts. And I'm not engaging what's going on in reality. Does that make sense? Okay. So too often we get caught up in this process because it happens so quickly. And we find ourselves trying to argue that what I'm feeling and what I'm experiencing is right. And we don't take time to come back and acknowledge that, oh, okay, this is what really happened. And this is where, if this is a, a blank sheet of paper for you, you can actually come back and write out what's reality. What are the facts that occurred? And you write out the facts. And then you can come over here and you can start writing out what does that mean to me? Whatever it is that happened back here, what does it mean to me? And then you begin to write out, what did I feel about this? And if you can get the other person to do it as well too, you can get a much better insight into what they're thinking and what they're feeling. Not to mention the process of actually slowing down to write this out helps people to calm down and helps people to think more clearly about themselves and actually gives them an ability to step into another's world. Okay. So we have reality, my interpretation of the body language. Uh huh. And then the perception comes into my interpretation. Right. A lot of people think that way, but um, ultimately, we're not, again, we're not in control of our five senses. In the, in the way that our eyes see things and the way our ears hear things. Um, we, we, we're not in charge of it. I mean, do you guys realize there's other sounds in the room right now than just my voice? Like how many of you hear the fan in the projector? Some of you do. Most people don't pay attention to it. They end up tuning it out. And it's not a conscious thought to tune it out the body just naturally goes, it's superfluous information, I don't need it, and it doesn't reach your conscious awareness. A lot of information gets just thrown away before it reaches our consciousness. Now, when we have repeated experiences over and over again, up, up, and I don't get picked up, I can begin to develop specific ways I look at the world. I begin to expect people not to meet my needs, to not care about what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, what I'm going through. I can't trust another person with what's going on in my heart. So I start to hold that back 
And the only thing I'm going to show them is what I think they want to see. Correct. Correct. You'll react to it even if it's not happening. Because it's happened here so much in your head when you experienced it before, you expect it from others, um, even if they're not going to be that way. Uh huh. Yeah. How does how does one get from being an infant to being someone who has that? Well, sometimes there can be um, actual genetic issues that contribute to it. Like there can be an actual biological cause for that. If you've got a um, if you got someone who's dealing with a, a serious form of depression, um, that's not due to what they would consider um, reactive issues where something has happened um, that causes the depression, a loss of job, um, loss of um, a, a family member, um, other stresses. When, you, when you've got a biological predisposition towards depression, um, the brain naturally drifts towards the negative. That's one way it happens. Um, another way someone gets there is repeated experiences over and over again where they don't feel heard. They don't feel like anyone has taken the time to understand this process for them. And because it's gone that way and things have gone poorly, um, they develop a really negative sense of self. Um, I see this with clients a lot where there's been emotional abuse, there's been physical abuse, or there's been mental abuse. You're no good, you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything. Um, it can even be as hard I I as this in some environments. What'd you get a B plus for? How come you didn't get an A? I expected an, an A. The B plus isn't good enough. So it's they're not really failing, but it's the perception the parent would be providing to the child that begins to bring that out. So that's another way that it's often formed. Um, a third way is if people try to make change and they try to get things different and it doesn't work. For whatever reason, they interpret it as though they've still failed. That brings them back into that negative loop. And when they get stuck in that negative loop, they begin looking for it all the time. They begin to interpret everything in that way because it's a means of trying to protect themselves. If they feel they've failed, like they go from one job to another, to another, to another, to another, they'll start to feel like I can't succeed in anything. So they, they start to assume I can only do menial jobs. So the jobs that they start to look for start to drop in the level of importance or level of income or level of ability. And that's all a way to trying to protect themselves from feeling like they're failing. Does that kind of answer the question? Um, when I talk about depression later this afternoon, I'll give a lot more resources on how you would change and or alter that tendency to think negatively. Okay. Where was I going? So as it progresses, it gets blown out more and more. It gets harder and harder. Sure. Correct. No. No. You can. But you've got to be aware of the fact that I, I think in this manner and I don't want to think in this manner anymore. Then I've got to do some things to begin to change this. That can involve something simple as, as praying with someone. That can involve talking to a lay counselor at the church. That can be reading books. That can be going to seminars. That can be going to therapy. 
any of these things can help us. Even spiritual disciplines can begin to help us to transform and change how our mind thinks um, and what we're going through. A lot of it is really about creating awareness um, where we can stop and look and truly develop a greater awareness of ourself. Um, that's what most people I teach this about. They're like, it's one of the first things that's given me an ability to step back and look at myself. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Is it, this is designed to create awareness because you can begin to look at why am I interpreting things this way? Is it because of what I'm feeling? Is it because of how I'm doing physically, you know, and the way that's shaping everything? The more we can recognize this, the more we can communicate with others. Oh, I'm having a bad day and I'm having a bad day because I'm physically feeling run down. I'm feeling exhausted. Therefore, I'm not responding as I normally would if I was feeling rested. If I can share that with my wife, then she's not going to feel like she's in trouble if I'm a little snappy or if I'm a little impatient with the children. She's not going to feel like she's done something wrong because I've been able to give her information that she can actually use to inform how she's going to put meaning on what I'm doing. But too often we don't communicate in that fashion. Too often. It is. Right. Right. Correct. Right. And this is where you can go back and you can go, well, I know when I grew up, I tended to think of things this way. And that's what I expected. Is that true of this person here now that I'm interacting with? Um, too often we expect the here and now or the then and there to just keep repeating itself over and over and over again. And we don't give people the opportunity to be new, to be something different because of that. And the only way we get to that is if we can be aware of ourself and how we interact with others. And, and ultimately what you're saying is I might think you're looking at me this way, yeah. but the truth is the other person may not be looking at you in that way at all. Correct. Be Correct. And it happens so fast that we're way over here in our feelings and responding out of our feelings before we've become developed any awareness of how any of these might be contributing to the way I'm responding to this person in front of me. You have a question? Yes. Yes. Correct. It'll drop back down into those deeper ruts that were formed as a result of whatever it was we were taught previously or we picked up. Sure. Sure. We got a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, for you it's yeah, it's it's well, correct, but that's that's your process here. His process with the reality, he heard mom say, "I have chubby feet. You're chubby." His perception of that, he's not applying anything to it. He's just hearing mom's tone of voice. He's seeing mom's face. He's seeing mom's body language, whatever that may be. He's taking in all that information. And then he begins, begins to put meaning on it. What does it mean that I'm chubby? And it's not just what mom says. What have I heard others say about being chubby? What does it mean to be chubby? And then he begins to come and take that back and he applies that not necessarily to reality, but he's going to come back here and he's going to apply it to his sense of self. So it begins to, instead of being something that's a term of endearment, which is likely what I'm hearing you intended it as, he heard it more as a criticism that you're fat. Well, 
just the initial reaction, it happens as it is, okay? He, the words have no meaning yet when he first hears them. But then he may hear from other kids at school what it means to be chubby. Maybe he gets teased at school for being chubby or being a little overweight. And it all begins to take on this negative connotation. So anytime he hears something about being chubby, he gets really down and he gets really discouraged in himself, which then begins to form a self-concept in the sense that no one's going to like me because I'm chubby. So as he continues to move forward, he's going to have this deeply rooted belief, nobody's going to like me because of how I look. My physical body is not good. Does that make sense? I do need to wrap up because we're supposed to stop at 1130. Um, if you guys do have more questions, please don't hesitate to come up and approach me and talk to me. I'd be happy to answer any questions about this. Um, I think that was the last, oh, that was backwards. I think that was the last slide, yeah. And that's my contact information if you ever want to reach me. Um, if you do want another copy of that form, um, you can email me, and I'll gladly email you uh, another one if you'd like it. Thank you.